Okay. So yeah, for the interest of people's time, I think uh, yeah, more people will be joining. Yeah, let's just start. And um, let me uh, give a short introduction first. So yeah, welcome to today's AES ESA talk. So my name is Jia Fu Mao, Chair of the Asian Ecology Section at the Ecological Society of America, which has been dedicated to advancing ecological research since 1994. So our goal is to enhance communication and foster collaboration among ecologists with an Asian background starting diverse ecosystems. For more detailed information, please refer to our AES website. So since last November, AES has been organizing AES ESE Talks, a quarterly virtual series that brings together diverse speakers from our members to field leaders, promoting collaboration and the sharing of groundbreaking research. So tonight, we are honored to welcome Professor Bing Xu from Tsinghua University for our third AES ESA talk. She will present Earth's observation, coastal urban green space and blue carbon. Professor Bing Xu has been with Tsinghua University's Earth System Science Department since 2008. She holds master and PhD degrees in environmental science from UC Berkeley and has worked as an assistant professor at Texas State University and the University of Utah. Her research covers data fusion from remote sensing, disease modeling, and the climate change effects on urban health. Professor Xu has published uh, many articles and received multiple awards, including the Elsevier Atlas Award. She has also served as a president of the Chinese Professionals in Geographical Information Science and edited several journals. So let's welcome Bing to tonight's seminar. Thank you. Thank you very much, Jiafu, for your very kind invitation and very kind uh, introduction. Um, I'm very honored and to actually give the talk at the uh, Asian Ecology Section, Ecological Society of American Talk Series. And as you know, the topic today for me is the Earth Observation Coastal Urban Green Space and Blue Carbon, since actually this is a pretty uh, probably interesting topic for you. So uh, um, I'm currently or I have been located in at Tsinghua University since 2008. Um, so now I cannot move. Oh, here. Okay. I cannot make this one. No. Um, okay, I, I could only see a portion of the slice. Oh, really? We can see the full screen. Okay. Full screen. Maybe you. Um... um. It's all right. Um. I don't know why. Oh, okay, okay. So here is the outline of my talk, and first I will very briefly introduce our, you know, the current research progress on coastal urban blue carbon, at home and abroad, and then I will give an overview of the space air field integrated earth observation platform for carbon research. And then I will show you some of the examples that we have done for urban green space and coastal blue, car blue carbon mapping. And uh, it may cover you know, China areas, some of the regions and also globally. And finally, I will talk a little bit on our field sampling, which might be more relaxing. Um, so here, urban carbon. So why do we talk about urban carbon and why green spaces? Because green spaces are the only natural carbon sinks within the urban areas. And in China, urban areas cover about 7% of the land area. So globally, actually, urban area covers less than 3% of the land area. So urban population accounts for 60%. So urban carbon emission makes up about 70% of the total nationwide emissions. 
and urban GDP contribute to about 80% of the total national GDP. So the, the urban area really, although the area is so tiny, like, but it contributes so much, you know, carbon emission and population and GDP contribution. So uh, in the global carbon sink, natural ecosystem makes up about 7 70%. So urban green space also a part of the carbon sink, depending on the sustainable actions taken by city stakeholders, like, you know, managers or residents, how people respond to this you know, this urban green space. And people think, you know, when we do modeling, we actually ignore the urban area or urban green space, but actually they they may, you know, they are very important part of the carbon thing. Therefore, the quantitative assessment of urban green space is an important aspect of evaluating the carbon balance in rural ecosystems. So as we know that the total cumulative CO2 emissions are taken by land and oceans, and also some of the portions will remain in the atmosphere. So we know with the more human activities or more emissions, actually the percentage in the at or CO2 in the atmosphere, the percentage will be taken up by the land and ocean will be decreasing. In this example, it shows from 70% to 38%. So really the capability is going to be less with more human activities or more emissions. So it indicates that the more we emit, the less the nature can help. So here is the research progress or people you know, are doing right now. And there are several problems or issues that involved for the global carbon budgeting. And as you can see from the graphs and, you know, for the first one, global carbon budget you know, or global LAI, and it's at eight kilometer by eight kilometer or carbon flux four degree by five degrees. And this is carbon, global carbon sink is half degree by half degree. So the research skills are mainly focused on global national level with relatively core spatial and temporal resolutions. So, um, and also the carbon accounting objects are concentrated on mostly above ground biomass. And also um, research on carbon budget is mainly focused on natural ecosystems. It never talks about the urban areas. So there are problems that exist. So for example, the high uncertainty in estimation of carbon sequestration in urban ecosystems. So large scale carbon research ignores urban ecosystems or farmland or wetlands, et cetera. So like the graph that shows on the left-hand side uh, is China's terrestrial carbon. It estimated to be like 0 0.2 pentagram carbon per year to 1.2 PG carbon per year. So it's about, you know, the variation is about six times, five or six times difference. So the uncertainty really is quite a lot. So, and also there's very rough classification system for the ecosystems. So it makes it very difficult to subdivide by species. For example, different species of plants, they could have different capabilities of absorbing carbon. So in this way, if it's coarse, a classification system, it would be very inaccurate or very high uncertainties. And also the remote sensing retrieval accuracy of ecological variables is low and it's difficult to extend the three-dimensional vegetation greenness to a larger scale. So if people do the field sampling, they usually uh, measure the individual trees. So it's very hard to extend to larger scales. So, and also at the urban scale, below ground or underwater biomass and soil respiration is crucial because we always, you know, think about, you know, above ground and also from remotely sensed data, it's easier to distinguish or uh, we can only look at the above ground or, you know, upper the water rather than under the water, the biomass and soil respirations. 
So we usually ignore those very essential variables or parameters that make our estimation not accurate or inaccurate. So uh, we talk about you know urban blue uh, urban carbon, and now we talk about the blue carbon uh, along the coastal line. So usually we talk about blue carbon, we mean three different ecosystems. So one is mangrove and the other is salt marshes and then is seagrass. So these three ecosystems have different characteristics. For example, for mangrove mapping, and there are more products and less uncertainty because people focus more on mangroves. So, and also mangroves are distributed along the tropical, subtropical intertidal zones and visual interpretation for edge and sparse mangrove is difficult, but still uncertainty is okay, is not that much. So it's estimated to be 137 K square kilometers in terms of areas. Um, and for salt marshes, there actually exist product, but not that many, and also very high uncertainty. And because they also distribute in subtropical and temporary intertidal and supratidal zones, so they are in larger um, tidal fluctuation zones, and also the phonology and tidal information are very important. So it's estimated to be 22 to 400 K square kilometers uh, in range, so it's like 20 times, you know, um, difference from estimation to estimation. So it varies a lot and it exists the largest uncertainty for salt marshes. For seagrass, there are few products and very few product and, and high uncertainty as well because the seagrass are located, you know, they are distributed along the coastal shallow water areas. And they are also distributed in subtitle zones. And sometimes they can be as deep as 50 meters. So it's very hard to observe underwater. And also they are affected by sea surface wind speed and waves and water depths and water transparency, seabed topography and sediment types, all of this different you know, conditions. And also some we also sometimes we ignore tidal flag. Actually, tidal flag is very important as the figure shows that the you know losses and gains gains of the tidal um, flag is quite large, particularly within China. And these are the current representative large scale coastal thematic mapping products. Um, I'm not sure why it shows only a portion. Um, but there are different, you know, types of the uh, the the wild the wetlands. And for example, the mud flats and sandy beaches and mangroves and salt marshes and seagrass beds and tidal wetlands and reclamation and aquaculture. And this colored um, means there are products, or you 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 know, even triannually or annually or or just for one particular single year. So if uh, the this matrix is very sparse, indicating there are no products in between with the weekend or white spaces. So in this mangrove, every five years, and actually until 2020, and now and we are making uh, this China mangrove mapping. And within all of these products, and um, because they have very poor spatial temporal consistency and very high uncertainty of different data set. As you can see, there are not much products um, there exist. And also it's lack of monitoring for key blue carbon systems such as salt marshes and seagrass beds, particularly seagrass beds. There are no much research uh, going on or it, it's very hard to, to see actually using even using remotely sensed data. Um, however, those coastal system and their resident species are under increasing pressures from multiple climate induced drivers and also non climate induced drivers. So for example, for the coastal blue carbon ecosystem, there are mangroves, salt marshes and sea grasses. The impact of, for example, sea level rise on those um, types are different from the impact to, for example, rocky shores and kelp systems or, water, or warm water coral reefs. 
So here is the summary assessment of the observed hazard to coastal ecosystem. So those elements are very important. They are very sensitive to both climate induced and also non-climate induced drivers. And they are actually impacted very differently as well. So in this way, and I will show you or just give you an overview of our the space air field integrated earth observation platform for carbon research. And the space is satellite borne and air aircraft or airborne or U, UAV and field sampling and ground choosing and those kind of integrated platform. And now I'm going to uh, uh, explain this a little bit. And by using the space air field monitoring network for the atmosphere and also, for example, temperature or precipitation, radiation, and those environmental factors, and also sensor networks and communication networks, an integrated ecological observation monitoring platform is established to provide real-time transmission and updates of essential ecological variables. And this is the framework for our uh, project on carbon sink and capacity modeling. Um, there are basically four components. And uh, um, the first component is on the uh, um, remotely sensed data classification of ecosystem. As we know, the urban ecosystem, and they have like, you know, street, street trees, and also they are, you know, distributed in residential areas or commercial areas or even along the transportation roads. So, and uh, we know that the species of the trees is important because the brow leaf might be different from the needle leaves and they have different absorbing uh, capabilities of carbon. And uh, therefore, um, it's good to have a hierarchical multi-level classification system and to define different categories and then extract those information and map it so that we could have, uh, you know, <clears throat> um, on the other steps. But the core objective is to do the fine estimation of essential variables for urban ecosystem and carbon sink and capacity modeling. So the key strategy is to use high resolution observational data from satellite and airborne observations along with bionic technology of vegetation to achieve high precision, multi-level estimation of remote sensing parameters for ecosystems. And also using this ecological both process and data driven um, models and machine learning algorithm to perform carbon sink estimation at different scales, including from individual plants and also to population and also to communities and urban uh, the whole urban ecosystems. So this is the whole framework of, you know, the carbon sink and capacity modeling uh, project. And here is the first component, which we, we, we did for the hierarchical classification system. For example, we have first tier of uh, forest and shrubland, grassland, wetland, cropland, urban rural, ecosystem, marine, ecosystem desert or other categories. And so this is a very rough or very broad um, uh, tier of categories. And second tier could be needle leaf forest and broad leaf forest or mixed forest or sparse uh, tree or shrubland or needle or broad leaf or sparse and also grassland and depending on the crown closures or, um, or percentage of coverage. Um, and also for the wetland, and we have the uh, tidal, the coastal uh, wetland, or the salty uh, brackish water, and also there are freshwater wetlands. And for cropland, and there are, uh, we have students doing cropland um, um, a mapping, and also um, for the abandoned cropland mapping. And for the urban rural ecosystem, which is very important, as you can see that uh, urban green space, I'm sorry, I didn't translate it into uh, English. Um, so this urban uh, green space include the public green space or residential green space or working unit, 
green space and also protection uh, belt or or com or industrial um, sites and also some scenery forests or those sites and they include as uh, urban green space and also you know there are residential area as well and marine ecosystem and desert ecosystem and third tier actually you, I couldn't see either and it's more detailed categories based on the second tier and the first tier actually is uh, are those different species of of the trees or even shrubland. <clears throat> and then we move on to the second component, which is the multi-source data model, uh, both data and model-driven extraction of ecosystem uh, parameters or variables. Um, so once we have those multi-source remotely sensed data, you know, we could extract, for example, leaf area index, NDVI, or NPP, you know, generate or uh, MPP, and then later on, and then extract, you know, first a biomass and then MPP and those kind of ecological um, parameters. And then based on, um, right, the second. Um, so this is the second component, which on land use classification and also essential variable extraction. So with input data, and in our case, we have um, Sentinel-2 data, uh, Sentinel-1, which is 10 meter in resolution, spatial resolution, also planet data with three meters. And we also have high um, resolution, higher resolution data set and extracting those detailed um, information, ecological parameters in terms with, and also uh, teams up with OpenStreetMap data set. So also we automatically gen generate the samples from urban areas and also non-urban areas. Also for blue carbon mapping, we automatically basically generate those training samples and also testing samples. And, and then to guarantee that we reach for a certain accuracy and for sample, uh, and then for sample purifications. And, and then we have classification model like using the monthly planning composite or Sentinel composite and do the machine learning algorithm and then output data. And this is for one um, ecological parameter extraction. And then the third component will be fine modeling of vegetation simulation and three-dimensional green volume extraction. Um, here is the actually individual tree here and we use a bionic modeling technology of life forms of extracting both stems and, and leaves of the trees and to produce three-dimensional green volume and then to generate three-dimensional biomass. And this is examples of some of the uh, species of the trees that we are working on. And these are five uh, different species and a thousand samples were collected for each species and then we set up the mesh model for individual tree in stems and leaves in hierarchical orders, and then generate the three-dimensional greenness volume, and then the biomass extracted. So here is the testing sets for, you know, uh, for the stems and also for the leaves. And first uh, we generate, we have the stems and then build on this uh, leaves left but there are some of the stems were remaining what were left there. So here in the last figure shows, you know, all of the stems and the leaves are separated. And then this is the resulting the stems and this is resulted resulted leaves. And they combined with will be a, a very accurate modeling of three-dimensional trees. And then finally, the first. A component will be the fine estimation of the spatial temporal dynamics of ecosystem carbon sinks. Um, so on the left hand side will be the data set. And then we have we apply the bottom up approach and also top down approach. Bottom up is from the, the bottom, the ecosystem process uh, based model. Um, and we consider not only individual trees, but also as we, as I said, it's a population of trees and also as maybe within one particular species and also different species or communities of trees and then at last to the whole urban ecosystems. 
and uh, and then we could you know drive this process based model to derive an EP. Um, so this right hand side will be the top down um, approach. Will be the uh, uh, the data driven models, and we have satellite ten set or OCO two those kind of CO two concentration data, and then using the transport mod atmospheric transport model. Uh, and also combined with deep learning to optimizing the CO2 concentration. And then uh, quantification of the spatial temporal dynamics of carbon sinks and then do the multi-scale validation. So I will um, focus on the blue carbon mapping and also uh, a green space, um, urban green space mapping today. Um, right, this is the... Uh, uh, four components of, of the uh, project frame framework. And so you see on the bottom-up approach and also top-down approach and getting this um, process-based model and uh, also uh, to derive urban carbon cycle uh, simulation products and then multi-scale validation and also using ground carbon flux monitoring. Um, so now I move on to the urban green space and coastal blue carbon mapping portion. So for this portion and for urban ecosystem, it's very it's hierarchical mapping strategy. For example, we actually from the pixel uh, base and then to object based, on the second one, and then this is a parcel uh, or a patch uh, or scene uh, with the minimum mapping unit. And on the left hand side, which is mapping categories and different uh, categories of urban uh, land cover and land uses. And because of why do we do this? Because of the urban population or urbanization process uh, going on very quickly. Um, so until 2050, our pop, the population is predicted to be, you know, 68%. So the city only occupies 3%, less than 3% of the Earth's land area. But this 60 to 80% of global energy consumption, 75% of carbon emissions come from cities. So as <clears throat> I just mentioned about China's uh, situation, which is very similar to this. So mapping this urban ecosystem very important or the work is very significant. Um, so uh, urban land use mapping, and this is an example of using a uh, uh, United States, and this is done by my uh, student. My actually, both of them are previous student, Dr. Tu and Dr. Chen. And Dr. Tu just graduated from Tsinghua and Dr. Chen, um, was my former uh, student, PhD student, and now currently a faculty member at uh, uh, Hong Kong University. And they both did research along this line, uh, urban land use mapping and how the city boundaries and also uh, the buildings and building heights and also the green space uh, extraction. So those are the urban land use categories, for example, uh, park and green space and commercial or administrative or airport or medical, educational, like public services and industrial and business offices. And those are different patterns and shapes and also spectral signals. So um, um, this shows actually very previous work that we have been doing in the past is the two decades of urbanization urbanization in the Poyang Lake area. Of Nanchang uh, area, as you can see the urbanization in red color progresses very quickly in the past like two decades. And, um, and this was carried out, this study was carried out earlier uh, in 20, about 2010. And, you know, along this urbanization, uh, we have been doing a remotely sensed data um, mapping and yeah, urban mapping. And this in terms of color, red indicate build up land and green color, which is a green um, space or vegetation, a blue color is soil. 
um and also because urban area actually they are expanding very fast and at the cost of you know arable land loss in china in particular so it's very high contribution dependence of urban expansion on the arable land since uh, 1990 so in the past like 30 years so approximately 84 percent of the new urban land is developed on existing arable land so this number is is huge and the higher the level of urban urbanization the stronger the encroachment of urban expansion on arable land loss and also this uh indicate the interaction between the uh, urban expansion and also uh, arable land or uh, cropland loss So this is the uh, product that we derived for the long term in the past uh, 35 years, higher resolution 30 meter mapping of the arable land in China. And this is the first uh, arable uh, land data set uh, for China. Um, so this is thematic, particular on, on cropland. Um, and also this shows from 1980s to 2021, you can see the dynamic changes of the cropland. And also on the right-hand side is the, the abandoned cropland. So the total uh, cropland, actually uh, the area increased 17% uh, increase. And also there's another side, a 16% decrease. So overall it's only a 1% change or increase for croplands in the past 35 years. Um, and also different, you can see that north um, and also east part, portion of China is more covered, but the, the northwest and because of the re irrigation conditions difference, and there are, you know, uh, less, um, much less arable land and also uh, less arable land changes as well. But the abandoned land actually occurred different areas and they occur quite a lot in Mongolia. Um, portion, north portion, and also um, Yunnan, um, the south of uh, portion of the China. So here is the um, cities linked to healthy China and healthy cities in China. And, um, you know, the, the, it's related to political, social, economic agendas of the cities and it's a mindset shift from a healthcare system centered on disease treatment to the one that combines um, health policy or promotion of health policy and the transfer of responsibility from health professional to the entire society. Um, also, you know, with uh, emphasis on the role of local uh, government, also on the residents. Um, so this is uh, how the cities can be a uh, healthy city that we have done in the 19, uh, in the 20, about 2016 or 2018s. So we started this healthy cities uh, commission. Um, this shows the impact of Olympic on urban green spaces. And um, mm, so the Graph on the left hand side shows before and after Beijing Olympic game. You can see that those are actually agricultural land. And they were converted into the very green vegetation. And you know, so in Barcelona, Greece, and Atlanta, or London, or Beijing, or Rio, um, those different cities and Olympic games actually promote this uh, area to become green uh, dynamic. It's a process of um, dynamic uh, greenness changing. Um, so this actually is urban green space exposure at multiple scales. And you can see from the middle graph and this uh, provincial scale and city scale, county scale and town scale. So with the resolution higher and finer and finer, actually you get different spatial variations of this green space exposure and exposure indicate there are human population. So basically we overlay this human population or demography data with this green space exposure data and to generate how much human exposure to those green spaces and to see the equality of the green uh, spaces. Um, so this shows the monthly variation in urban 
uh, green spaces in global cities. So you actually, it, it contrasts from the north and the south countries. And because of seasonal changes, and also the dynamic uh, is very different. And this shows the contrasting inequality in human exposure to green space between cities of global north and global south. And the blue color indicate global north and red color indicate global south. And uh, those uh, green space exposure level and this Gini index indicating the inequality or equality level or degree of the green space exposure. So we conclude that the uh, global South cities experience only one third of the green space exposure level of global North cities. So which uh, global South, which is the developing countries and global North, which is uh, advanced or uh, developed uh, countries. So if you can see, it's only one third of the green space exposure. Uh, for those developing countries. However, the green space exposure inequality in global south cities is nearly twice that of the global north cities. So the inequality is much uh, larger than the developed countries. So we actually apply those multi-source remotely data fusion technique of uh, spatial, spectral, and also the angle um, a temporal and those different uh, elements to do this. Um, I'm sorry that I didn't get, uh, you know, translated all to to the English, but this is uh, a nighttime light and we use the uh, uh, DMSP data and the VIRS data. And you can see the DMSP data here, uh, you know, very saturated because this old data set and also have blooming effect. But for the VIRS data set, we, which is much better, uh, because it's after 2012, it's new, newer sensors and newer data set. So, but we need to do a consistent uh, data set along the time or temporal span, also spatial span. So we need to get consistent data results. And then we did this um, 1984 to 2018 long-term nighttime light data products. And this is done by... Um, um, one student in our department and also another student by myself and it's uh, Dr. Ren. He also graduated. Dr. Ren uh, did this and I don't think it, it's dynamic. I don't know. Um, so it's based on 1984 nighttime light and it actually changes and become much more vigorous or more active for human uh, activities. So the previous, so this one is the China data set. Probably you cannot see very clearly, but it's within the China boundaries. So, um, um, and this one is the urbanization development, a global long-term NTL data product, a global scale. And probably it's not very clear either, but it's the global product. So development process of urbanization brings about significant increase in ANTL and urban development, urban renewal, and policies such as new urbanization contribute to a significant long-term increase in nighttime light overall. And also during the COVID-19 period, there has been changes in the trend of nighttime light brightness. And also the magnitude of changes varies in different regions, accurately depicting the strategic responses made by humans to control and prevent the spread of the virus so it's very interesting. We actually use this nighttime light data to indicate uh, land use uh, overlays with land use categories and actually to generate human activities or, or even human migrations uh, during that period and to link this to our epidemiological infectious disease transmission modeling and which actually turns to be very interesting results. But I'm not going to talk about this today since this is not our topic. Um, so this is the ur global urban green space coverage and also exposure levels are changing in the past 20 years. And they are both increasing and uh, uh, for global north and global south. Um, however, and the inequality of green space exposure in global cities decrease, it indicate improves overall, but the rate of decrease in southern 
cities is four times that of northern cities. So indicate it improves a lot for the developing countries than the developed countries. So also indicating there are larger space for development or for improvements for the developing countries uh, in the past 20 years. Um, and so this shows the China coastal land cover map at 10 meter resolution. Um, and this is the long time series mangrove mapping. And we have done this uh, since 1986. Actually, China's mangrove and has increased, actually doubled um, since 1986 until uh, recent years. And also we use Sentinel-1 and 2 to get the 10 meter uh, res resolution mapping results. Um, so this this is uh, the area and you know the tendency is uh, some of the areas will decrease and then increase and some of the area areas like Guangxi, Hong Kong um, and they will consistently increase and so it's different patterns of increase and this is coastal land cover map based on tidal level corrections because based on those uh, tidal uh, high tide and low tide, and also corresponding to uh, remotely sensed data with the gorge stations. And we we map those um, high tides and low tides and to generate those, you know, intertidal zones, and then to map you know, what occurs during this intertidal uh, zones. Um, actually, I got this just uh, yesterday or no, the day before yesterday. Yesterday, And this is the very initial preliminary results of area of blue carbon at national level. Actually, I, I didn't show you the, uh, um, the, the blue carbon along the coastal line, that graph. So we summarize into a uh, national level and, and this is the map. So now, uh, finally, I talk a little bit on, maybe I don't have much time. Um, I will talk a little bit on the field sampling. And this is on blue carbon ecosystem um, um, integrated um, monitoring. And this is, uh, we use the uh, UAV and on board uh, LIDAR and also hyperspectral data, <clears throat> also high, sorry, hyperspectral sensor. And those are the flux tower. And, and th this is the um, uh, Shenzhen station, the ecological station that we stayed in. And this is the, along the Shenzhen <coughs> street and um, uh, Shenzhen one. Um, and those are hyperspectral sensor on the lower left. And uh, this is on board the car. And you know the lidar and both lidar and hyperspectral and multispectral and also side view or perspective views of the trees, um, and also we have backpack, and, and this is a Dongchong mangrove wetland. And some of the buildings are extracted, and also um, the mangrove heights and mangrove topography uh, were extracted, and. It can be mapped into individual trees, and those are the tree segmentation, um, individual tree uh, delineation, and also each species. And those, like uh, Shenzhen Wan as an example, and those are the individual tree segmentation, and also tree crowns and tree canopies were derived using this LIDAR uh, point cloud. And we calculated, actually, they have two, 20,000 uh, uh, trees, actually we, we counted those, it's like more than, it, it's very, actually we, we did the whole sampling. This was done by my student, current student, um, Miss Zhang, which is, um, she's very hardworking and very uh, um, energetic, very smart girl. And he collected all this uh, data set and not by herself, but a team of, uh, students. Um, and these are the LAI results that generated using the data and different 
and places in Shenzhen. Um, and this shows the average tree height in Shenzhen, and it's about eight, um, eight meters. And actually, um, it's it's very you know the are predicted and the true image are very similar. They are about the same. Actually, the the tree height was accurately derived, um, and the 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 long the tallest tree is twenty seven, and the um. The average is eight meters. And those are seagrass bed, which is very hard to see. And you can see uh, actually, but if you take the UAV uh, images, actually multispectral image could capture the seagrass bed, which pretty uh, easily. But if you are familiar with the site and also with high tide and low tide, it's different. Yeah, thank you very much. Great, yeah, very very nice talk. Yeah, so thanks you for the yeah great talk and to everyone who, um yeah, uh, do we have uh, any questions from uh, our audience? Yeah, we don't have so many people, but I think uh, yeah, as mentioned, uh, a lot of people would like to uh, you know watch the re uh, record uh, the videos later. So yeah, any question from our um audience? Uh hi, I've got a question. I hold you. Yeah, go ahead. Hey, hi. Uh, thank you for the very informative talk, and I, I enjoyed it. Uh, my question is about how successful or unsuccessful so far regarding uh, below ground processes using, you know, remote data, remote sensed data, and I'm, I'm just wondering what kind of approaches have you applied so far. Um, actually, um, we actually uh, did three different categories of um, blue carbon, except for seagrass bed. Uh, actually, the other two categories are much easier to be ca captured. Uh, the mm -hmm. mangrove and salt marshes is easier, uh, much easier than sea uh, seagrass. So for seagrass, we don't have a product right now. So we that's why I didn't show you the coastal line uh, mapping results. And we have um, the tidal flat or or the, the the tidal flats. And also we have the mangrove and we have the salt marshes, but without the uh, seagrass. We actually thought about using this um, called zhong uh, chou um, uh, like using resources from on site, and if some people do the surveying or, or diving and they take pictures, and we get those pictures. Like this cannot matter because it's really hard. And but the on site, we actually when we take the UAV uh, imagery, it's actually pretty easier to capture those you know seagrass. But if they are in deeper, then for example, we only could capture like. Uh, depending on the color of, of the ocean. And if it's very clear water, then we can capture probably as deep as, you know, 10 meters or several meters. But if it's more than this or several meters, then it's very hard. So uh, so I showed what I show you is very clear water in <laughs> along the <Okay>. east <laughs> coast. Right, thank of, you. Yeah, yeah. Thank you. And also, we are planning to use the hyperspectral to measure underwater, but we haven't done this uh, yet. But I have a classmate who actually in the U.S. have been doing this for years because I have been doing hyperspectral remote sensing in the U.S. like, you know, many years ago. Yeah. Okay. Thank so, you. Yeah. Cool. So, Thank so you. I have a question. Yeah, you mentioned... Um... For the mangrove in China, uh, especially for the period of I mean, 1987 to 2016, you know, the, the, the fractional coverage, uh, I mean, it's actually uh, doubled in the past year for this period. Do you have any thought on why, you know, uh, yeah, the mangrove, you know, increased a lot during that period? Um, yeah. <clears throat> so um, I think it's different because some of the places like Guangdong province, they decrease first and then increase. But like in uh, 
Guangxi or Zhejiang or Taiwan, and they actually keep on increasing. So it really, I think, depends on different areas. And also in recent years, and people know that mangroves is very important and also can be a cash crop or, or cash, you know, um, uh, vegetation or or those kind of things. So people are getting incentives or protecting those mangroves. So even they plant mangroves elsewhere and um, in order to get these incentives. So um, because now we have the, we call that ecological red lines in China and from the Department of uh, Natural Resources and to indicating those areas you cannot be touched. Uh, it cannot be touched that across this red line of making <clears throat> this protect this line being protected. So the policy is um, becomes more and more rigid. So people are more, you know, will make more higher and higher costs to to cross this red line. So it makes people, you know, to to think about protect the mangroves. And also some of the region I heard that in Fujian, they have the first like carbon um, compensation because of planting mangroves. So um, so I think in recent years, it's, it's obvious that there are policy encouraging those uh, measures. But in the past, and I think still um, people are, um, uh, mangroves also have, you know, this um, wind protection and wave uh, reduction. So people actually know that mangroves are, are pretty good in ecosystem functions. So for the disaster uh, or emergency response team, and they are tend to be growing, you know, even invasive species of mangroves along the uh, southeast of coastal line. So actually they grow very fast and with higher, much higher biomass. Mm, but they now and people realize they probably grow too high and to actually prevent the bird or seabird or other you know species and to fly in so um yeah it's it's controversial um mm, things and happening in, in this area yeah interesting yeah any other questions yeah i still have one more i mean for the yeah, you also show the results on the, you know, Arab, Arab abandonment land in China. So for this data set, I mean, your team or other teams also have this uh, global scale results or data sets? Um, yes, we actually, <clears throat> we are working on it. But the, but my student, Dr. Tu, actually, he, uh, she, she um, has done this. We previous targets actually to do global mapping, but she already finished her PhD. So he will, she will continue doing this, but uh, probably our team will not that, you know, quickly because we not right now, we focus on blue carbon and also on the sustainable development goals and also how uh, combine the earth system model with the anthropogenic or you know those kind of uh, social economic dimensions of SDG so um we our focus is has slightly changed um so but she will Dr. Tu will obviously keep on working on global uh, mapping of this cropland also abandoned cropland yes yeah that's she's a... very capable capable uh, girl as well yeah cool. yeah definitely a natural next step yeah. Thank so, you. Thank you. Yeah. So, yeah, you know, I'm just cu I'm curious, you know, I'm not doing any remote sensing, you know, I just use, I'm a user, user remote sensing products. So, yeah, you, you know, you you show, I mean, your students, you know, they, uh, yeah, she performed, uh, you know, this, uh, uh, you know, uh, vehicle leader, uh, leader, uh, hyper, uh, hyper spectral observations in, you know, different places, Shenzhen or elsewhere. I was wondering, you know, for this type of, uh, you know, remote sensing work or, or observations, do you need any license or some government approval to do those or just, yeah, yeah PRC, yeah. You got all the very important key or very key points. 
<laughs> in China, we do uh, need the license to fly, and but it's very hard to fly in Beijing. Um, but in Shenzhen, it's much easier, much better, because the air is not that, uh, you know, intensively controlled. And there are different timing or duration of the time that you cannot do the fly. But usually you can do on the all the other times. But if it's not look, for example, Shenzhen one, and and actually we did it once, but then the other time we couldn't do it, and the you know the executed, the police came and uh, you know we we have to run, and actually it's it will be very serious if you keep on doing this. So we it, we are very fortunate that we actually didn't fly yet. So. <laughs> Yeah, but um, but you can, you know, the good thing is that you know which area you can fly and you cannot fly. And because on the uh, Dajiang, we use the Dajiang, the uh, UAV, and that UAV has the sensing that it can tell, it will tell you if you cannot fly during that area. For example, in Beijing, within the sixth ring, you cannot even raise up your your UAV. It cannot fly up. <laughs> it will just lock there. Um, so obviously you cannot fly. But in Shenzhen, usually you, if you can fly, then uh, you are free to go. Yes. Okay, interesting. Yeah, still have uh, any other questions? And also, right, and also you there there are ways to apply for those licenses. It just takes longer time. And one is from the local um local Guan uh uh bureau uh yeah. security bureau, right? And then uh then they also up to you can also apply for the other uh, pathways as well. And uh, once you get the license, it, you are free to go. But but the license can be has to indicate the time and the duration, and all of those information are very strict as well. Yeah. Okay. Cool. Yeah. Nine thirty p.m. here already. Yeah. Okay. So yeah. Thank you again, Professor Xu. Yeah, for your great talk and also. Yeah, thanks to those people who have drawn and asked questions today. So yeah, that's uh, the end of this AES -ES talk. And uh, we hope you keep joining us for the next ones and uh, take part in more AES events. Okay, thank you all. Thank, thank you. Thank you very thank much. You. Thank, thank you. Thank yeah. you, Jiafu. Thank you. Bye-bye. Bye-bye.